Good morning, Paradox Church. It is so nice to be back with you. My husband and I were driving in uh, about an hour ago, and we were like, Redlands is such a fun town. Paradox is such a fun church. It's going to be such a fun Saturday. So thank you, thank you for the invitation to come back. All right. I have to warn you, uh, our scripture and our story today, my message, it's a little heavy, so just hang with me. But I think that today's scripture passage actually requires a little bit of backstory for anyone who's not familiar with King David's messy, messed up adult life. So I know you've been talking about his wives, and honestly, I think there are a lot of Taylor Swift songs that could be sung along with today's message, but I'll leave that to your worship team to think about. Um, So the young David that we celebrate just a few chapters prior to what we're going to read today, he's the brave shepherd boy who brought down the giant Goliath uh, with nothing but his slingshot and a river stone, and now he has grown up and he is the king of Israel. But sadly, like so many leaders in our world history, the power and the wealth that went along with David's leadership warped his heart And he becomes filled with greed and entitlement, and he has this illusion that he's above the law. I know that's shocking that a leader of the world would feel like they're above the law, but that's what we're working with in David's story. So today the story begins with David staying home from a battle in an ongoing war with the Ammonites and the Arameans. Now we're not told why King David decides to stay home from this battle, Maybe he was tired, maybe he felt like his status afforded him a little break while his troops fought it out, but in any case, they are all fighting and he remains in Jerusalem in his palace, and that's when the trouble begins. So he's lounging in his home, and he spies a woman named Bathsheba bathing on her rooftop, and he sends a message, well, he sends a messenger, I should say, to retrieve her. And um, the better translation for the Hebrew verb lakash is to take. So he sends a messenger to take her by force. So I don't want to mince any words here. He's abusing his power. He is assaulting Bathsheba, and she has no consent to uh, respond to these advances. So I know ancient scripture doesn't have a lot of words to describe what's happening here, but in today's culture, we're very familiar with this abuse of power. We can give a name to this, and that name is rape. And it should be noted that David already had seven wives at this point in his life, as well as servants and slaves and prostitutes. This is all very well recorded in scripture. And so David, in other words, is a collector of women. Also, it notes that he has 20 children by all of these women. I just want to let that number sink in for all of you, especially if you have children of your own. David had 20 children by all of these women. So if he lived today, we can be assured that he would have his own TLC show. Okay. So scripture paints us a picture that tells us David's appetite for power and lust and acquisition exceeded anything that we could consider healthy. So David decides and therefore um, determines that he shall have this woman Bathsheba for no other reason than he's home, he's bored, and he wants her. So he brings her to his palace and he sleeps with her because he's the king and he can do that. And she has no agency to say no. And then his sin begins snowballing. So Bathsheba gets pregnant. That's a problem. That's not a good look for a king to have impregnated one of his own soldier's wives, especially when he already has seven wives of his own, and he was staying home from battle at this time. So that soldier was off defending his kingdom while he was lounging in his palace, sleeping with his wife. It's not a good look. So David schemes, and he thinks, here's what I'll do. I'll bring Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, home from the battlefield to spend the night with his wife. And then in nine or so months, when the baby is born, everyone will assume that it was conceived that night. That's pretty sneaky, right? But it doesn't work. He brings Uriah home from the battlefield, 
but Uriah is so dedicated to God and his king and his fellow soldiers that he refuses to sleep in the comfort of his own home while his fellow troops are still at war. He like sits on his doorstep and he's like, I'm not going inside. I'm just going to sit here. I don't know why the king brought me home, but I'm not going to go inside in the comforts of my own home. Ah, oh, David's plan is thwarted. So he schemes again and he says, okay, okay. This is nothing that a little alcohol can't solve. So David gets Uriah drunk and gives him a little nudge towards his house, towards the bedroom. And again, Uriah is so faithful and he refuses to go inside. He's like holding on to the doorposts. He's like, I will not go inside my house. This is the wrong thing to do. I'm not abandoning my fellow soldiers. I'm not going to do this thing. Now David's really sweating. This is becoming a really big problem. Time is ticking. So Uriah is refusing to help David cover up his sin. He's refusing to let him rewrite the narrative of David's sexual assault of Bathsheba. So David decides desperate times call for desperate measures, and he sends Uriah straight to the front line of the battle and has him killed. Now, David can pretend to have compassion on Uriah's widow Bathsheba and marry her as wife number eight. He's really masterminding this whole cover-up situation. So sadly, this third and final plan works. Uriah is killed. Bathsheba is forced to marry her rapist, King David, to cover up his crime. And ironically, the name Uriah means my light is the Lord. And we have literally watched David's sin snuff out the light of the Lord in this story. So on that happy note, we come to today's scripture passage, and God is going to see the utter wreckage of the human lives that are happening at the hands of King David, and he's going to send his prophet Nathan to confront him. So this comes to us in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in this certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guests who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he has no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword and the, of the um, Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son." For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. These are the words from 2 Samuel. Amen. Amen. So there you have it. The prophet Nathan was sent to tell King David this pretend story about this poor man with this one little lamb. This one little lamb, it was like a, it's like a daughter to him. And this rich man has a guest coming to town. He has a whole flock. He has, let's just call it 20 children, seven wives, something like that. 
And, and he comes to this poor man and he says, I'm going to need that little baby lamb of yours, that one that you think is like a daughter. I'm going to need that. I'm going to take that from you. And David says, that is, that is so terrible. Who would do such a thing? That is terrible. That is terrible. That man is terrible. And, David, and Nathan says, well, it is terrible. And David, you are the man. You are the man. That is you in the story. And David's like, oh, oh, yeah, I see that now. I see, I see what you did there. Okay, okay. Okay. So most of us are not really steeped in the language of sin. Now, unless you come from an evangelical or a Catholic background, then you can probably wax poetic about sin. You can write haikus about sin. I am very sad. I did something very bad. I am a sinner. Shout out to all you English majors out there. Little sin haiku for your Saturday. Um, but the rest of us Christians, we're a lot more comfortable talking about corporate sin, you know, communal sin rather than personal sin. And there are important aspects of why we talk about corporate sin and communal sin, because if we f- center our faith too much around a personal relationship with God, and we ignore the fact that God has a historical choice of being a God of a people group, not just a few faithful individuals along the way, then that puts us in danger of thinking that God is an exclusively personal possession, that God is my God. But really, there is this important historical note that God is our God. God is a God of people. However, on the flip side of that, if we entirely abandon our personal responsibility to live a faithful life as a disciple of Jesus Christ, then we also abandon the language of sin, and therefore we weaken the meaning of grace. And these are really big, important concepts in our faith tradition. So today I'm going to venture out of my comfort zone a little, and maybe you'll join me and venture out of yours and talk a little bit about the, con- the concept of sin. So when I talk about sin, I mean anything that we do or say or think that separates us from God's loving, peaceful nature. So when we say things either to ourselves or to others that are not kind or loving, things that break us down or break others down, things that cause pain or hurt, things that actually push us further and further away from following in God's loving, peaceful footsteps, those would be considered sinful words. And when we think thoughts either about ourselves or about others that are not kind or loving, things that push us further and further from following in God's loving and peaceful ways, those would be considered sinful thoughts. And when we do things, either to ourselves or to others, that are not kind or loving, things that cause others pain or distress, things that disrupt harmony, things that cause rifts, things that take advantage of others or push others away, that would be considered sinful actions. Now, I'm pretty sure most of us cannot relate exactly to David's situation unless any of you here today are secretly power drunk kings who are shirking your responsibilities and using clear power imbalances to prey on your royal subjects. Um, I don't know, raise of hands, I don't, I don't think so, okay. So, however, I do think that his story reminds us that we all have to be held accountable for our actions and for our sins Because the only way back to wholeness is by acknowledging that we have all fallen short of God's hope and dream for each of us. So in trying to bring our lives alongside David's extraordinary context, I was pondering, you know, what what was really at the core of David's sin? And I think that as the king, he felt like he was above all the laws, including God's law, of loving our neighbor as ourselves. And in Hebrew, like I said, that verb lakash, to take, is used both when he takes Bathsheba, and also it's used when Nathan is telling his prophetic story about the rich man taking the poor man's lamb. So in both cases, something is being taken that doesn't belong to the taker. There's greed and there's dissatisfaction under the surface of that action of taking. So for us common people, us non-royals, I wonder too if at the core of our sins is this feeling of greed or dissatisfaction. And I wonder if our sins are most commonly tied to our inability to embrace our own imperfections 
and also just live imperfect lives with a feeling of contentment. So let me try and parse this out with some specific examples. Let's say your marriage isn't perfect. It's fine, but it's not like the movies. It's not like the first romance you had when you were a teenager. And so you take up an affair. Maybe your paycheck is enough to get by. It, it's fine, but it doesn't allow for you to have this unlimited extravagant spending account with which to live a life of luxury. And so maybe you begin to take from somewhere else, i.e. steal. Maybe your plans in life aren't going perfectly like you had imagined that they would. And so you start to feel this resentment and this anger and you take it out on your family members. Maybe you don't have what you imagine to be the perfect life, and so you take on an attitude of jealousy or bitterness. Maybe you haven't achieved the perfect status that you were hoping to achieve at this point in your life, and so you take credit for projects and ideas that aren't yours in hopes of getting ahead with your boss. None of these examples are even in the ballpark of how King David's womanizing, sexual assault, murder, and lying, that, that's a completely different category. But you can see how the mindset of greed and dissatisfaction coupled with privilege and some power really primes the pump for human sin. We work really hard to create the perfect life for ourselves, don't we? We work really hard to project to the world an image of perfection in ourselves and in our families, in our careers, in our lifestyles. You know, we're living in this era of social media when our lives are broadcasted largely by our own doing to a wide network of friends and colleagues and acquaintances. And we have perfected the art of portraying perfection. So we show the world the photos and the reflections of our happiest, most successful, most celebratory moments. And we very rarely advertise moments of pain and sorrow and struggle and doubt. We don't like to broadcast our disappointment and our frustration and our conflict and our anger. But I think that we all know by this point that we're all living behind some sort of facade, right? We all know by now that we're living authentically, and that includes the good and the bad, the pretty and the ugly, and the ups and the downs. But even though we're just pretending that we have it all together, and we all know that we're all just pretending to have it all together, it's still hard, not, it's still hard to admit that we don't always have it all together, that we all have flaws, that we all have issues that we're working on, or issues that we are not working on. Yes, I will own that. We all know that we are struggling with negative self-talk, and we have estranged relationships, and we're often exhausted, and we're hungry for connections that we don't always find. But instead of addressing those imperfections or taking steps to fix the brokenness, we often find ourselves giving in to sinful thoughts, words, and behaviors that just keep widening that gap and pushing us further and further from God's loving nature. I can't tell you the number of times in my 10 years as a pastor that I've had people come up to me who on the outside are in happy marriages, having happy family lives, you know, having the perfect Christmas card photo every year, and they tell me they're having an affair or they're getting a divorce, or they're having an affair and they're getting a divorce. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've had smart, well-loved, put-together people come to me and tell me they are clinically depressed and they're considering self-harm. I can't tell you the number of times I've had people who I think are excelling in their work, getting promoted, making more money than I will ever make in my lifetime, come and tell me they are miserable and they're wanting to make a career change desperately. In other words, every time I'm given a peek behind the scenes, I have found that there is no perfect person living a perfect life out there. It just does not exist. So if you're still living under this impression that you're the only one struggling, the only one feeling unsure or anxious or confused or lonely or tired 
or guilty or resentful, I want you to hear this truth today. You are not alone. You are not alone in that. I think the lesson in David's story is to try and address our brokenness, to face it up front, and to keep it from snowballing. David saw Bathsheba, and he had some sinful thoughts about how he should take her. He could take her. Someone else's wife, his royal subject, and he could do that because he was the king. And he, he thought to himself, you know, maybe I, maybe I should do that because I, I have those, you know, those other seven wives. But, like, they're not really enough. And maybe he was just bored. And maybe he was just feeling lonely in that moment. Who knows what his exact reasons were. But if David had been able to stop there and address his brokenness and admit that he was having really sinful thoughts of greed and lust and dissatisfaction, there's a good chance that he could have stopped the sin from going any further. But instead, he forever altered the course of Bathsheba's life and he ended Uriah's life prematurely. And later, if you keep reading this story, one of David's sons, Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar, and as revenge, another half-brother, Absalom, kills Amnon. And so the chaos and the sin that David creates in turn just creates more chaos and sin. And that was part of Nathan's prophecy, right? That you've created this havoc, this destruction, and it's just going to keep snowballing in your own household. So how do we stop sins from going any further, from step one? So in the Christian vocabulary, we have this word, confession. And in its most simple form, it's simply an opportunity to acknowledge where we have fallen short. Now, our Catholic friends will probably say that confession is tied to a sense of shame or guilt, but that's really not the purpose of confession. The idea is that by addressing our sins up front, by naming them, we take away their power. We hold ourselves accountable, and that paves the way for us to heal and become whole again. There's this resource called the Book of Common Prayer, if you're not familiar with it, and inside of it, there's a simple and powerful prayer of confession that we sometimes paraphrase and worship at my church, and it goes like this, forgive us for what we have done and for what we have left undone. And I love that because it summarizes all the ways we may have fallen short in one simple sentence. So if you don't know where to start, that's a pretty good simple prayer of confession to just unload your heart at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day or both. And I think confession is one of those acts of discipleship that can and should set us apart from other people as Christ followers, that it's our commitment to seek wholeness and holiness by way of confession and transformation. Truly, as someone who is following in the ways of Christ, someone with a deep and abiding faithfulness, that is someone who, that's not someone who's never made a mistake, that's someone who knows how to own their mistakes and actively address their sins in order to navigate life. And we benefit from confession as well. Our mental, our physical, our emotional health improve when we take an honest look at our hearts and say, you know, there's something lodged in here. There's something cracked. There's something that I need to take a moment and work on. And then we've just taken the first step towards transformation. And you can confess to your pastor, Craig. You can confess to a counselor or a therapist. You can confess to your spouse. You can confess to a trusted friend or even just to yourself. It's just about taking that first step, measuring the distance between where we are and where God created us to be, and saying, I'm going to break the cycle of destruction now. This sin is not going to go any further. I'm going to address it right here, right now, before anyone else is hurt by this. And maybe the process of repair will then require forgiving ourselves for the things that we've held on to for years. Maybe it will require asking for the forgiveness of someone else that we've hurt. Maybe it will require the help of a therapist or a doctor or a counselor. Maybe it will involve acquiring an accountability partner who walks alongside you in life 
someone you can confess to regularly and who hears you and doesn't judge you. Maybe it's about joining a support group or simply making different conscious choices every day. Whatever it takes, know that there is so much power in allowing ourselves at any age to be vulnerable to change and to healing. So this photo that's coming up on the screen features an example of kintsugi, also known as kintsukuroi, which means golden repair. And it's the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with golden lacquer. And this actually treats the breakage and the repair as part of the history of the object, rather than something to hide or disguise or cover up. It actually highlights this crack as it mends the crack, and that makes the pottery more beautiful. It's much more unique, and oftentimes it's more valuable. So I think this is the perfect example of David's lesson for us today. You know, David is credited for writing the book of Psalms, or at least many of the Psalms in the book of Psalms. And Psalm 51 in particular is said to be perhaps his response to this encounter with the prophet Nathan. Once he's had a chance to reflect on his actions, realize that he is the man in the story who took this poor man's lamb. And Psalm 51 says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So our faith understands the power of embracing our brokenness. This is all over our faith tradition. It wasn't until Jesus broke the bread that it was multiplied and fed 5,000 people. It wasn't until Mary broke that alabaster jar of perfume and anointed Jesus' feet that he was ready for his death and burial. And it wasn't until Jesus said, this is my body broken for you, that his life and death became the bread of eternal life. Brokenness is part of our Christian DNA. It's part of our story. It's part of our tradition. And so I hope that if you are hiding a porcelain crack in your heart, you'll take today as an opportunity to seek healing and let God fill it with the golden lacquer of grace. You have nothing to lose by embracing your brokenness, by confessing the ways that you're falling short. You have nothing to lose except your shame, any guilt you're holding on to, and any pain that you're harboring. And by confessing, you have everything to gain, including wholeness and transformation and renewal. So let us embrace our brokenness as individuals and as a community as we go forth. May it be so. Amen.